G'day, bird nerds. Oh, look, I'm really off my game today. Let's. I can't even find where I've got that photo. Hello, bird nerds. Gee, that, that was super sloppy. That's because I'm distracted today because I've been having a Twitter conversation with someone who is in the in the audience now and has jumped into the comments. And we were talking about Cartoon Corner earlier on, World of Sport, um, talking about how old I am. But bird nerds, I'm Grant. I'm a bird nerd. I'm coming to you from Wurundjeri country in the western suburbs of Melbourne. And my guest today is from that amazing Bogan town where they oh. do good, good. You know, well, it's either, um, what's Adelaide famous for? Crazy murders? Right from oh, the from the from the from the seventies and eighties, um, the the Beaumont yeah. children, so which is potentially tied up with the whole crazy things, but also um, pie floaters. What more could you want? <laughs> what more could yes. you want? <laughs> Sasia Gerhardi, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Adelaide. Uh, School of Biological Sciences or School of Biology, one of those, look it up. How are you, Saskia? Thanks for being with us on The Bird Emergency. I'm really good. Thank you for having me on. And, of course, we're talking about Australia's weirdest bird, I think, uh, often referred to as Australia's oddest bird, the Plains Wanderer. Saskia, let's start with what is the Plains Wanderer? I mean, in nearly every bird book that you pick up, from the last 50, 70 years, it'll be on the same page or the page before or the page after quails. Yeah. How closely related is the Plains Wanderer to the quails? And actually, we've got true quails and button quails. Let's start with something easy. <laughs> yeah, just, just get straight into the genetics. <laughs> Um, yeah, so Plains Wanderers are actually not related at all to any sort of quail, button or otherwise. Um, they're a super unique species. Like you say, they're like one of these really odd looking birds and it's because they're really genetically unique. They're the only representative from their family. So when we sort of classify animals, we've got genus, species and family. So they're the only remaining birds from that family. Um, and that family is actually closest related to shorebirds, not Australian shorebirds, South American shorebirds. So they're a really unusual bird with a really long genetic lineage um, that's got them here. And as a result, they've got some really wacky sort of ways that they look and behave. So they're quite an unusual little species. Yeah, I think um, now I'm, I'm, uh, great danger talking off the top of my head over something that I think I read uh, ages ago. But I think it's one of the oldest genetic lineages of any of the birds still modern day birds still occurring in australia is is that really your understanding thing. yeah i don't know if it's the oldest but it's, it's it is really old like i'd have to check my notes but like a couple mil is million years is sort of ringing a bell like i know that they are have really been in that family for a long time and sort of evolved and adapted um yeah during sort of a lot of changes in australia uh, which is, yeah, I guess one of the reasons they're so special because they're such an unusual little little creature. But, yeah, I'd, I'd have to check up on the, the exact times and dates. But, yeah, yeah. I know it and, is a really old family. And and supports the the Pangaea and Gondwana land um, uh, evolutionary pathways, doesn't it? So uh, Yeah, yeah. And, and that songbirds evolved in Australia and, and, and that... Um, con conglomerate mass, uh, rather than as was presumed in the earlier earlier years, that songbirds all were northern hemisphere and that they spread yeah. south. So yeah, so really, they're not, they're not songbirds. They're um, yeah. yeah, they're yeah, like quails and other sort of shorebirds. They don't fall into the sort of the short, the passerines sort of family. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, they're non-songbirds. They make they they don't sing. They make the most sort of like a really low ooming noise. It sort of sounds more like a cow than anything. So yeah, certainly can't can't give them that tick. They are, yeah don't sing well. Okay, well let's uh, while I look something up because I uh, I didn't even think to do this in advance because I was I've been so preoccupied with whether America was going to implode into 
craziness, and thankfully it looks like it didn't. Um, tell me, tell me what the basic premise of your work, your your PhD, is about, and I'll look something up. And uh... <laughs> I'll inter- entertain the audience while you read. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk among <laughs> yourselves. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So my research is about plains wanderers in South Australia. So uh, a lot of the research that's come out of plains wanderers has been based in Victoria, New South Wales. You had a chat to um, Dan a few years ago uh, talking about his research there. So. A lot of what we know is based off those two stronghold in those two states. Uh, and then the birds that we have here in South Australia are in a lot fewer numbers and sort of acting a little bit different. They sort of have different uh, behavioural and uh, sort of uh, habitat specifications. So we're sort of looking into that. So my project's sort of bit, uh, based into four parts. We're looking to begin with to improve monitoring techniques. So these are a highly cryptic little bird. They're really difficult to find. And when we have such a small population like the one in South Australia, trying to maximise survey efforts is really important. So that's one part of it. We're trying to understand the vegetation that they're living in here in South Australia, trying to understand a bit more about their um, uh, sort of threats uh, and their sort of behavioural adaptations to these threats. Uh, And then my last chapter... Hang on, I'm trying to think what my last chapter is. What is my, oh, looking at the status and distribution here in South Australia. So we, the last study of Plains Wanderers here in SA was done in like the 90s um, and we haven't really done a lot of study on them here since. So we don't really know where these birds are existing, uh, whether they're still in their old ranges, whether they've moved into new ranges or whether we've just lost them from a lot of these areas. So in a nutshell, that's what I'm trying to work out. Okay, so so if I if I heard you right, there's some historical information about where they did occur and a, a, a guesstimate of the numbers. But now, if we were to try and have a distribution map or an estimate of population in South Australia, those things just are un, uh, unknown reliably. We just don't know, yeah. yeah. So... Plains wanderers were first described in South Australia. So like Gould back in the 1800s first sort of described plains wanderers here in the Adelaide Plains. Um, so they used to live quite regularly around the plains of Adelaide, but obviously as that sort of started to build up and urbanise, we lost the birds from those areas. Uh, we used to get them in the York and Air Peninsulas and up sort of through parts of the Mallee. Uh, and now it's hard to tell because there's not uh, the target of surveys in those areas. So we don't know whether those birds are truly lost from those areas or whether we just don't have the survey efforts there to let us know about their population numbers. So at the moment, our best guess population sort of comes from a couple of anecdotal sightings, a bit of the research that I'm doing, um, and yeah, just sort of some general guesswork. So it's, yeah, to help us sort of manage the species better, it's gonna be important for us to help work out where they are and what they're doing and yeah. Where they're still existing. So, is there a um, conservation listing in South Australia as endangered or critically um, endangered? Yeah, criti- critically endangered in SA, and that's based on that it was historically recorded. But yeah. when when is the last reliable sighting uh, in South Australia or in? Any of what's the most westerly um, reliable sighting, say, in the last 10 years? Westerly would be yeah, like, there was a sighting about four years ago in the Nullarbor, which is like if you know your geography in South yep. Australia, that's about as far west as you can get before yep. you hit Western Australia. Yep. Um, when it was, and it's kind of unusual because a lot of the distribution maps sort of suggest that Adelaide was kind of the most western edge of their range so then to get one all the way out there is quite unusual and yeah like i say there's little follow-up at the moment so we don't know whether that sighting is a one-off or whether there's populations there or whether they're migrating out there or just you know one one of the birds caught the wind and got himself a bit lost so yeah they've um they're quite unusual in their occurrences here in sa they just sort of pop up in really random spots and um yeah we don't really know when or why or how Okay, I'm I'm just looking down at my um, Australian Bird Guide distribution map, and uh, there seems to be one or, or one spot near near nearish to 
Alice Springs, then there's the sort of three corner country, the channel country, then running continuously down through the uh, the Murray into um, that central southwest, New South Wales, Victoria, and down into it's hard to tell on this map, but may, I would assume the west of Melbourne, but it looks like it's maybe even going a little bit east of Melbourne. Um, yeah, so that's it, sort of their known range, yeah. Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm surprised I can't see a dot for the for the Nullarbor. Now, that's such sparsely populated country. Would you err on the side that, there's probably more Plains Wanderers filling in that um, that sparse country rather than the pessimistic view that there's probably, you know, they're probably not there because we don't have any records. Wait, I mean, as a scientist, yeah. I, know you, I, I know you're probably going to be unwilling to jump into it, but are you are you an optimist or a pessimist? Let's... I think with the oh, <laughs> um, so I think with the the Western populations, I would probably suggest those are more birds that have just sort of got themselves a bit lost. But I think with the ones that we have in South Australia, so in that sort of map that you described, we sort of have a lot of the sort of northeastern pastoral districts of South Australia. I think there's a lot more birds in there than what we assume. We've only really sort of scratched the surface as far as areas that we've. Uh, assessed for Plains Wanderers uh, and found Plains Wanderers on. So I would suggest that, yeah, there's probably still a lot more birds in those areas. Um, I know there's some research happening in sort of the York and Air Peninsulas about um, trying to detect Plains Wanderers there and people feel pretty confident that they're still existing there. Um, so, yeah, I think a lot of the reason that we say South Australia isn't a one of these sort of stronghold populations or contributes a lot to the larger population is just a, a huge lack of research. Okay. Uh, th that record on the Nullarbor, was that on public land or was that on private land? Do you know? I'll have to double check. Yeah, it's I, from the top of my head, I think it was private land. Um, okay. I think there was a group um, of people doing surveys for, for something unrelated. I think it was a, a vegetation survey or something and a, a, a trusted birder saw one and sort of went, oh, my goodness, what are you doing here? Um, so, yeah, and it's all been, like, uh, published in sort of, like, the Rare Birds Committee and whatnot as a, a confirmed sighting. So we're pretty, yeah, we, we feel confident that they were there, whether they're still there or, yeah, exist there in a permanent situation. We're not too sure yet. Now, let's um, let's share what I wanted to share because you did mention, uh, I th hopefully people are going to be able to hear this. This is from... Um, one of my favourite resources on the internet, xenocanto.org, where people upload their recordings of bird calls. And all being well, we're going to hear... Let me just put the... Uh, oh, we're in. Let's make sure that's there. We don't want to mute the audio. So let's, let's hear the Plains Wanderer. <laughs> So it was hard to hear above the insects, but I might run it again. It's kind of like it's kind of like the Wonga pigeon or the um, you know that that booming. Bronze wing? Yeah. You, I you tell me it looks, sounds like a bronze wing quite regularly. Yeah, yeah, it does. Okay, and that was uh, that was in at Daniloquin. Thanks, Frank Lambert, for recording that and popping that up. That's from 2015 in Daniloquin. Um, so thanks very much for doing that, Frank. I think um, it's it's really great when people uh, share what they know and what they hear. Often with really, you know, critically endangered birds, the calls aren't shared because. People go out there and do the wrong thing and try and lure them in and you know for their photography or whatnot. That's bad. So let's just get that out there. Don't do that. that. 
Um, I've made the point before, Saskia. If you're if you're sitting there with a recording of a bird call, especially if it's a territorial or a contact bird call, what you're essentially doing is just going to the front door and bashing on it incessantly. That's what you're doing. You say, "Hey, I'm here. I'm here. Pay me attention." That's not good for anyone's mental health, and I'm pretty sure that the plains wanderer would not appreciate it. So don't do it. Get out there with your binoculars, though, or your or your long lens on your camera. Yeah. Um, have you been out spotting, looking for the plains wanderer? Yeah, so we just finished up our, our field season a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so we spent quite a few long nights out looking for plains wanderers. We um, we don't spot like like they do in the eastern states. We've started using thermal technology. So um, plains wanderers, like I sort of mentioned before, are a highly cryptic bird. They're really, really hard to see. If you're going out during the day, you've basically got no chance of seeing them. I'll be working in areas I know a plains wanderer is in and still won't be able to find that bird. Um, but at night time, using a thermal image, you can get a really nice contrast and be able to pick up the heat signature of the bird. So we use that um, and it's been fantastic. It's a really great way for us to survey the birds and, um, yeah, try and find them. And it's, yeah, led us to, yeah, find a, quite a few more than we thought were out in some of the properties originally, which has been really exciting. Obviously, that's far less intrusive for the yeah. for the birds. So, um, again, going sort of slightly off topic, but it's related to studying, you know, critically endangered cryptic birds that might be um, really susceptible to uh, disturbance. Do you think mm. that when a study now goes through ethical approval that there might be a shift towards using thermal imagery rather than any other techniques and maybe just soundscape um, techniques? Yeah, I definitely, I mean, as an ethical perspective, I think it's definitely um, an improvement. We've been able to, like, observe males incubating chicks without disturbing them. You know, you don't need to go up and look at them. You can just see them from the car and you can just leave them alone, which has been excellent. Um, it also just improves the capability of seeing these birds. We did a couple of trials. We'd have a spotlight out one side of the car and the thermal out the other. Uh, and I think the spotlight picked up, like, one bird out of the whole you know field season so the thermal is certainly superior in um detecting these animals and i think when you're talking about critically endangered birds and you want to get this sort of detection up as high as possible to understand the population numbers it's important to use that sort of tech so i've seen it being started to use on things like uh fascigales, and i think uh, it's been used on bilbies so i think it will be something that we'll uh start seeing a lot more of in science um i think that's really exciting it's cool to sort of see these um new technologies being embraced by the scientific community. How does that um, methodology using the heat, uh, the heat seeking technology um, stack up against the more traditional methods in terms of cost and reliability for nocturnal um, birds? I mean, we, have you got enough information about the plains wanderer with your study yet to know if it is a better method compared to the studies you've been able to look at in maybe the last 10 years that have occurred? As far as my study is concerned, it's definitely improved our detection capability. So before I started this study, there was this great little anecdote that sort of said, if you're using spotlights and if you're using them in Victoria or New South Wales in the strongholds of Plains Wanderers, two hours or so before you find a Plains Wanderer. Um, and then if you do that in South Australia, in my main study site, which is called Wolf Matter Station Reserve, uh, 40 hours before you see a plains wanderer. Um, so when you're looking for a bird that's not in quite as many numbers, we need to sort of get that one up on them uh, in any way possible. And we definitely found that the thermal was a good way to do that. So that's, yeah, it's been a really a great thing for us. The, so the can, can, can I just stop you there? Because I want to talk about that 40 hours. Is that 40 hours in your study or 40 hours in the earlier studies in South Australia? Earlier studies. Early okay. studies, yeah. So how much did the thermal um, imaging bring it down? Like what's your hit right now in terms of hours? Yeah, so it's hard to tell because we've had a boom year, so we had a yeah. lot more birds, but we were sort of finding birds within the first 30 minutes to an hour using <gasps> a, um, thermal, but, so but, a lot more but, superior, yeah. But is it a boom year or is it just that the previous studies have not been able to detect the birds because of the yeah. methodology of the study 
That's the interesting is, thing, isn't it? It's the really tricky thing here in South Australia. So this study that I'm doing is really forming a bit of the baseline of uh, what we know of birds, especially in the northeast pastoral district. So it's really hard to make these sort of assumptions and sort of say, oh, well, it's because the thermal is superior. It's because it's a boom year. We, we, we don't know. Um, we're hoping over the next few years to get a better idea of it. Obviously, we're sort of coming out of this La Nina. Um, so we're assuming that things will start to dry and perhaps the population will start to decrease again. But yeah, like you say, it's, it's hard to know. We don't know whether these populations have always been established here um, or whether, yeah, they, they've just come because of the weather. So yeah, time will tell. So um, I want to talk about uh, the the bird, the habits a bit more in um, uh, in a little bit. But first, so let's get some comments up to over there. Thirty minutes, yes. Wonder Llama can't sort of believe that. That's great. Uh, there we are, uh, Llama. That that comment took all night in nineteen eighty seven. That infers that you've been doing studies on the plains wanderer so you use the comments tell us tell us your 1987 history um 1987 i'm guessing that that was probably that would have been about miss free love hoodoo guru's um uh time frame llama's llama's probably as old as me let's see i'll see if i'm right in a minute saskia what kind of habitat are you likely to find the Plains Wanderer in? And as an extension to that, is its occurrence really um, uh, closely linked to any particular vegetation, either species or um, just type? Gee, that's a good scientific term, isn't it? Vegetation type. <laughs> No, but it's a really good question and it's like one of the most exciting things I think personally about the South Australian population. Uh, so in Victoria and New South Wales, the Plains Wanderers are a grassland specialist. So they, they live primary in grasslands. That's what they're known for. Um, where we're finding them here, not a blade of grass, like nothing. We're not even talking tussocks or anything. It's a, it's a really open plains, uh, but you'd be, yeah, struggling to call it a grassland. Uh, it's dominated by a species called sclerolina, which is sort of just a, a prickle bush, basically. It's a very low um, prickle bush, and it's sort of um, that's where they're living in. So it's really interesting to have this bird that's been sort of classified as a specialist living very much in habitat, which is what you'd very much call unideal. The plains wanderers are sometimes referred to, you might have heard them be called like the Goldilocks bird. You know, they're, they're super picky. They don't want their grasslands, you know, too dense or too sparse. It has to be just right. Um, and we're finding them nowhere in this just right. So it's quite exciting for us because we're sort of wondering whether these birds are more adaptable than what we first thought, uh, whether the where they're living is just really marginal to them and they're just living on what's left, um, or whether, yeah, they can use a variety of different ranges and resources. So that's been one of the more exciting parts of this project is trying to work out what on earth they're doing here in South Australia and why this specialist is living in um, very much not grassland. But, but see, I, I want to be nitpicky again, and I think this... Um, highlights part of the problem that we have when there is very little funding for mm. ongoing surveys and counts, okay? And depending on who does the work and writes the paper, sometimes the wrong conclusions are drawn. Now, you're, yeah. what, what, what you've just told us about where you are finding Plains Wanderers in south australia mm. might might mean that all of the other conclusions have been drawn out of expectations rather yeah. than rather than actual uh, drawing any firm link between any vegetation whatsoever it's really hard to know like a lot of like in the 80s um a lot of sort of plains wanderer preferred habitat is sort of this grassland matrix like um they're really picky, like in these sort of areas, you've got these, this almost this formula, you know, it's like 50% bare ground, 40% grasses, the grasses need to be like, I think it's no more than 30 centimetres high and 30 centimetres away from each other. Like it's a really precise formula. And a lot of that grassland was preserved for Plains Wanderer habitat um, and managed to keep that sort of that open grassland structure. 
Uh, and that's where a lot of those sort of surveys had. So it's hard yep. to know whether those birds are just, that's just where those birds are living in those regions and that's their preferred habitat there, um, or whether the birds we have in South Australia are sort of, maybe they, they never lived in grasslands or maybe because the grazing that we've had in sort of the Northeast pastoral district has been historically quite intense. So we've lost the grasslands, the birds are still living in what was preferable habitat, but is no longer. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's sort of the exciting and difficult thing about science. There's um, a lot of questions and sometimes it's hard to pull an answer when you have a, a just a small data set. But yeah, it's certainly something that we're working to answer over the coming years. So what was the genus that you said? Was it sclerotina? Sclerolina. Sclerolina. Um, okay, let me, I'm just going to get it up so that I can... If, any, um, if yourself or any of your listeners have spent any time sort of in the arid lands, it's the, the prickle that you're constantly pulling out of your socks. It's like this sort of usually a two sort of pronged prickle. It will be, it's just stuck everywhere. It's a pain, and, um, and, nasty thing. <laughs> and is it um, divericata or bra no, brachyptera? is the association that they live in, yeah, that's correct. Okay, yeah. so let me just pull that up so that we can uh, tangled bassia or otherwise known in some parts of the country as uh bindi eye so, and it gets called copper bird quite a bit as well if that gives you any indication as to the nasty sort of plant it is yeah and of course um uh here we are i'll just pull it up so it's it's common in victoria common in victoria and south australia uh, I'll just pull it up and see if we can get a uh, picture and I'll share that. Gee, I'm not having much luck with this mouse today. Come on. Here we go. Specimen images. There we go. Ah, oh, yes, it's got that three barb. Okay, let's share this. Uh, sorry for everyone who's uh, uh, just following along, but I think this is important to be able to see what we're talking about and it will support my next uh, comment, I think. Okay, let's full screen that. Yeah, so okay. that gives you a good idea of like the, the prickles that they've got there. And then yeah. if you can see sort of the veg, it's quite a, it's a, a short shrubby sort of plant. Uh, usually probably doesn't sit much higher than 30 to 40 centimetres. Um, and, yeah, this is where we, we find yeah. plants under it. And so that's going to be my and, – and it's quite fleshy too by the look of it. Is when those, it's lush, when there's yeah. rain. If it hasn't been rain, it, it looks a bit, yeah, gnarly and dried and, yeah, a bit, bit yeah, nasty. So, so looking at that image, as you say, it would struggle to get be, um, higher than – Knee high, okay. yeah, yeah. I would, I, I would think. So uh, there's a, the wicked spines and the fleshiness. Let's just scroll through a couple of those. Um, so often the association is made that it's tied to particular grasses, you know, and maybe someone might be talking about thermitas, the kangaroo grass, or maybe danthonias, the wallaby grass or maybe in other habitats, you know, people have tied other other birds and other animals to spin effects. But it may just be whatever plant occupies that ecological niche. As long as they're present, the bird might be able to, to hang on. And the other factors might be rainfall or even insects that are occurring. I, I, I don't know. But I think we've always uh, assumed that the... Uh, the association was really with the, um, with maybe the, the the seed, the seed load or something like that, and, and that's sort of one of the uh, interesting questions. So, like as you saw from the seeds, there they're they're not edible, and they they sort of they're a plant that colonised that area really well because it's a really hardy sort of seed. So when you have this sort of heavy grazing, or you have um, you know these sort of bust years, we have you know significant drought those seeds can stay in the soil and survive for a really long time. So they're usually these coloniser plants. Um, but the seeds aren't really palatable. Like, you know, something like a plains wanderer wouldn't be able to get into it. So when we think of plains wanderers, we know that a lot of their diet's made up from, like, grass seeds. So one of the interesting questions we're looking at here is what are these birds eating out here? We assume it must be mainly insect-driven. 
Um, but yeah, it's um, yeah, we, we we don't know. Yeah, we still have to analyze that data. Yeah, because I think that's another assumption that's been made is that we, that they were graminivores, you know, mm. grass grass eaters, grass seed eaters, whereas they may be far more omnivorous uh, yeah. than that than has been assumed. Uh, and that we find them. Oh, sorry, we find them with a, a lot of um, flowering plants. So when we do have these little rain. Um, events come through obviously sort of the more arid lands you know we get this huge abundance of flowering herbs when we get that we sort of tend to find planes wanders around that and we assume that's because that's bringing more insects in so it'll be interesting to sort of try and yeah a lot of the data I'm talking about is very early so do yeah 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 but that's a whole point yeah. Sorry, that's the whole point of having a nice long conversation because we can tease it out. When when, yeah. when you say um, flowering herbs, are you talking about Asteraceae, which are like the daisy um, family plants, or is it Lamiaceae, which is more down that sage kind of um, uh, families? What what are the what are the seeds? I'm, uh, well, actually. Grows you, you, well, you, you're not. Uh, I'm. Uh, I'm assuming. I mean, I'm jumping ahead to where I wanted to talk about methodology again. But, but you're not collecting specimens of plane wa- planes wanderers and cutting them open like like happens for the seabird trials with mm. plastic mm. Or, or whatever. Um. So how how are you determining what the birds are eating? Is it only yeah. from watching them or or is it from uh, fecal matter? How, how are you doing it? Yeah, so this is um, where biology gets really charming. So I spend a lot of my uh, my field days picking up planes on her poos. So we, you'll be, when we're catching these birds and banding them, one will sort of explosive poo all over you. And most people will be like, Ugh, but I'm like, yes, get a swab quick. You know, like we're going to collect this. So, um, yeah, we, we're looking at a, a scat analysis to um, so try and work out what they're eating. Um, we also tracked a number of birds over the past um, spring. So we put these little um, tracking GPS harnesses on our birds. So we got a really good idea of the home range of those birds. And then we're able to then go and do vegetation surveys in those areas and get an idea of what veg was present while the birds were there. And then sort of assuming that they're spending a lot of their time foraging, uh, we're able to sort of try and work out what plant species were preferable in those areas so yeah, that's sort of how we've tried to work out a lot of that. Um, and then a lot of the flowering things are like you say, those little daisies, we get um, yeah, a range of sort of peas that sort of just pop up when we have these rain events. Um, yeah. The Northeast pastoral is a very boom bust uh, cycle. So when you have these good events, it's, it's like, it's magic, you'll have rain. You can't get out for two days because it's like, completely like just the plains are just a mess. By the time you can get up, everything's in flower. Like it just happens in front of your eyes. It's incredible. So, yeah, lots of little flowering bits and pieces, especially at the moment, yeah. When you take a faecal swab or collect, um, is scat the right, uh, the, the right term? Yes, that's for, the term we for, use. Yep. Yeah, okay. So... What information are you able to collect or, or, or are you aiming to collect? Is it basically dietary information or are you also getting things like um, parasite loads and things like that as well? How, how extensive is the analysis that you're able to do? Yeah, so the analysis we're looking at is just dietary. So we're, like we say, we collect this swab. Um, and then you can run it genetically with known samples and look for matches. So if I know that X, Y, and Z plant is available at the time I collected the, the swab, uh, we can then run it against those plants and see if they, they match. Uh, so then you can try and work out and say, oh, yes, that, that plant was present in the scale, it ate that plant. Um, and then you can do similar work with insects. So you can say, you know, these are the insects that we caught in insect traps while we're out there. Um, we can run them against the, the scat, the genetics of that scat to try and work out what was present in there um yeah there's a lot you can answer with genetics um we're not looking down to the, the, the gut microbial stuff just yet but it's definitely something that we've um, we've talked about and thought about especially with captive birds versus wild birds whether so that gut microbe is really important uh what sort of uh elements are in there and how we can try and best uh support our yeah both captive and wild populations 
Okay. Um, just wondering where best to go next. Let's uh, let, let's talk about the genetic information that you've been able to uh, gather. What ha- what has it? Or what have those um, uh, results told you about the diversity of the wild population that you are familiar with? compared to the captive population, and that's the captive population at Monato. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. there's a number of captive populations throughout um, Australia. So there's a few Okay, okay. So, so, you're, so you're comparing against all of the known genetic material. Yeah, so right? yeah, okay. you're probably about like two months too early. We've just sent our um, genetic samples off to be analysed. So we collected... 60 or so samples during our last field season. So we've just sent them off to be run. Uh, Before that, we only had, I think it was like two or three samples that were analysed in the sort of the genetic program that the Plains and Recovery team is currently supporting. Um, So their genetics is really, it's quite interesting because we'd expect speciation, like we'd sort of expect the South Australian population, the New South Wales population, the captive populations kind of, have sort of they keep to themselves they sort of have a, a clustering effect when you analyze it but what we find is it's just a big melting pot like the south australian birds are just as related to the captive birds as they are the new south wales birds so it's just okay. this sort of big melting pot in there there's no sort of speciation happening and we don't know if that's a result of the fact that these birds just sort of aren't showing sort of changes in their genetic makeup or whether it's because they're a really mobile population. So which the Victorian birds come to South Australia, go to Queensland, come back again. So it, yeah, it does open a bit of a can of worms. <laughs> so I was waiting I was waiting to bring up this comment or question. Yeah. That's <laughs> and, and I was waiting for that because I, I knew we'd go there. How far do individuals tend to wander? And that's one of the great unknowns, isn't it? That yeah. Um, if 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 that speciation is not occurring, so that we're not getting a Queensland race and a South Australian race and a and a Victorian race, mm. it, the assumption that will have to be tested against all the genetic information in in uh, in the coming years is that maybe these birds do disperse very mm. widely, and and yeah. that's uh, so maybe. Maybe it's not unusual for birds to pop up from anywhere, and that they may have they may have come from anywhere. Yeah, so there's sort of two parts that I can try and answer that question. So we just did a big tracking event, um, yeah, a couple of months ago, uh, putting uh, GPS trackers on birds. So we had ten out there that we okay. were tracking. Quite- just let me stop there. Are they harnesses or are they leg flags? Uh, no harnesses, so they're wearing like a backpack. Yeah, so yeah, they've got okay. a VHF, which is a very high frequency transmitter. Yeah. Uh, that's the one that sort of you know you see David Attenborough and you've got the scientists yeah. out with their yeah. like radio tracker. That's that yeah. one, and then it's got a GPS on it, which is talking to a satellite, which just logs the location of that bird accurate to a meter or so um, out in the plains. So I just did a heap of that collection uh, and have analysed that data and. Most of the birds had incredibly small home ranges, which is quite unusual. We were expecting them to have really big ranges. We had, um, but they were sort of staying quite close to where we caught them. We're assuming that this is because, again, conditions are really good at the moment. So sort of following that theory that when resources are high, a bird doesn't need to extend extra energy to move further. If it can get like a good seed stock, like just to its left, it's not going to move kilometres if it um, doesn't need to. So we're sort of assuming they're like that. But I tracked one female and um, she was just on a little adventure. Like she just, every day she'd moved like another 500 metres and she was probably like two to three k's away from where I originally caught her. So they definitely wander far. Um, I know the Victorian team have quite a few instances where they'll be tracking birds and they'll just disappear. disappear. They'll send plain yeah. drones out and those birds are gone. And like, um, if we think of like a chuka now where there's quite a good plains wander population, um, as you may know from watching the news, that chook is pretty much underwater at the moment. We don't know where those birds have gone. They're, we we assume they're somewhere, but we don't quite know yet. So and, there's a, a lot and, that we don't know about wandering behaviour. And not only is a chooker underwater, but so much of the known habitat in, mm. in Victoria and uh, New South Wales has Definitely. been underwater in the last couple of months. And in the last year maybe a couple of times. So yes, does, yeah. 
So dispersal kind of almost is a no-brainer. Maybe it's only the females and not the males because yeah. let's because let's talk about their their habits. Um, mm. Polyamorous, right? Yeah, so they're they're not faithful birds. Well, the female yeah. certainly isn't anyway. Yeah. Um, she, um, yeah, so she sort of, like I say, they're sort of they're from their own family. They have these unusual character traits. This is sort of one of them. It's sort of like emu. She's she rules the roost. Like it's a it's a ladies' yeah. world out. And the, the planes are there. Um, she'll call them for a male. She'll sort of attract a male into her range, which she uh, sort of manages. Uh, she'll lay eggs. Uh, and then he'll go and incubate the eggs and she'll, you know, head off and to the next territory and go find another fella. So, yeah, they're quite an unusual bird with that behaviour. It's certainly not something you usually see. And then their coloration reflects that. So the beautiful pictures that you see of this, you know, this upright bird with a speckling neck and the big, you know, red patch on it, that's the female. She's the really big bird that's sort of quite showy. And then the male's like, he looks like half her size. They're usually like half the weight as well. A lot of pictures that I've like shown people, they're like, oh, is that the chick? It's like, no, that's that's her fella. Like they're, they are, like they're really quite small. And like, yeah, it's, it's the dimorphism with the, the birds is quite incredible. Compared to say a a bantam, a, say a, a, a jungle bantam, do you, I think most yeah. people know that kind of yeah. chicken. How do they compare in size? smaller they're kind of like i'm trying to think they're like the fe- the biggest females i'll get like 90 grams so we're kind of th- like think like a plover like they're they're you know they're small yeah they're, they're well, little birds well um, uh, think think dotteral rather than rather than yeah sorry, uh, but I thought, yeah. Oh, right, sorry i meant yeah like, yeah like a, yeah. a hooded plover or a, yeah like, like a hoodie kind of, yeah yeah so oh, that was not, a bad example yeah, yeah, yeah uh, well it's just yeah. that it's just that common name thing, isn't it? Because the masked lapwing, which old people like me think of as a plover, they're way, yeah, way they're bigger. Cool. Way, yeah, way bigger. No, yeah, yeah, so at the smaller end yeah. of it. They, people are quite usually shocked. I when I certainly first saw pictures of them, I was thinking, yeah, like lapwing size. They they look like a sturdy big bird, but yeah, they're tiny little things. Um, and I guess that's what, half the reason they're so cryptic. They're they're quite small the way they get around through a landscape. Well, let, let, let's talk shorebirds just a little bit in comparison. Redneck stint kind of size? Well, yeah, yeah, I think that probably yeah. be a fairly good yeah, yeah. Yeah, comparison. Yeah, okay, they're, they're, so, they're small. Yeah, I can yeah. hold one in my hands like quite – yeah. they're tiny little things, yeah. And and that's the danger with, all, with collecting all your information as a birder from photographs. You would mm. think that they are bigger, but they are. They have a big they, presence, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, now the male does all the husbandry duties. Um, do we know enough about what the females get up to? Are they, are they mating with several males, perhaps over many territories? Do we, is there enough information to know that? There's not. That's sort of the assumption. Uh, there's really not a lot known about their breeding habits except for what happens in captive environments, which, of course, is highly modified. Like we're sort of putting captive birds together that we want to breed for genetic, you know, richness and whatnot. Mm. Um, so there's not a huge amount known about their, um, yeah, their, their wild habits. But the assumption is that, yeah, a female will move into multiple territories, especially in like a boom season. Like she'll just try and get as many clutches out as possible, uh, perhaps when seasons are a little bit more, uh, yeah, like resources aren't quite as, as rich. Um, we think maybe that cycle sort of slows down a little bit. But, yeah, like I say, not, not enough data yet to know for sure. Yeah. Based on the quantity, the, the quantum of data that you're able to get using the current methods, how many times, how many years or how many seasons do you think – a survey like yours will need to be repeated to be able to confidently talk about numbers and perhaps gather some of that information about what the females are really doing rather than being assumed to be doing. Yeah, I think, and it is such a numbers game, I think multiple years is needed and multiple years during different seasonalities. Like, So we've collected some nice little data sets during a La Nina year. It's been beautiful out of the plains. They're unrecognisable. They just look spectacular. Things are doing well. Plains wanderers are doing well. 
Um, but then we need data sets with when things aren't doing so well. So like in Victoria at the moment, we're too much rain for Plains Wanderers. And then a few years ago out at my field sites, it was, you know, banks in the middle of a drought. So it was really horrendous for them there. So I think it's important to sort of have a really rich data set of all those times. Um, and then, yeah, the populations are so variable within that. And we don't know if it's because they're moving or because when we have these uh, poor conditions, whether the population does decline. So, yeah, I think to manage these birds efficiently, there's, yeah, so much more work that we need to do on them. Now, when you're actually capturing birds, so mm. you're, you're mist netting, I'm, I'm guessing? No, no. no. Okay. How, Thank how, you. Okay, so there's a couple of questions. I'll let, so you can go through the, the whole lot. How yep. are you capturing them? Then yep. uh, you, you're taking faecal swabs and, and weighing yep. and whatnot. I'm assuming that you're banding as well as putting a harness on. Mm -hmm. If somebody is an avid bird watcher, can mm -hmm. is the information publicly available about what colour rings or whatever, anything mm -hmm. like that that you are, are attaching so that somebody who sees one, if, if they're a skilled birder, can they report what they see? Like, is there actually a, a way for them to do that now? Yeah. All right, a few questions there. I'll try and yeah, start. Yeah, and start. yeah. But, uh, but I think they're all logically logically linked. Yeah, so. logically. Yeah. So, yeah, so to catch planes wanderers is, is an absolute dream. So we don't need to mist net them. Like I was sort of saying before, we thermal image. So we'll go out and try and find a planes wanderer. When we're driving along and we see this little glowing blob that we say, oh, that looks, that looks like a good bird um we'll hop out with a, a fishing net um and walk very slowly up to them and you can just place the net on top of them these guys okay. have very poor predator defense methods yeah. so they just kind of like bunker down i don't um if you've sort of seen like curly pictures where they like lie on the ground yeah. they look quite intense that's sort of similar to what a plains wanderer does so i usually say to anyone like any field workers with me i'm like finding them's the hard bit once we've got there just everyone can just take a breather once you've seen the bird on the thermal, we, we, we're pretty much going to catch it unless something happens. So they're, they're a dream to try and catch. Um, just finding them is the tricky bit. And then once we catch them, we take them back to, we've got a field processing kit in the back of my ute, uh, and we uh, go through all those sort of um, processes there. So we'll weigh the bird, uh, we'll collect genetic samples via feathers, uh, we'll take a, a fecal swab, leg band, like you mentioned, uh, and then if we're sort of doing a tracking study, we'll put the tracker on the bird if it's a correct weight. Um, and yeah, so we can go through that. The leg bands that we're putting on the birds, and I believe this is the same as what the Victorian and New South Wales team is doing. Uh, we're not colour banding like um, a lot of these projects do. We just have a unique aluminium uh, band. So every bird in Australia that's banded has a unique number um, that is unique exactly to that bird. So no other bird will have that. Yeah. So if so, you were to be able to So, so the only way to identify individuals is to recapture the bird. From a, can, from, a ca from a casual obs observation. Yeah, um, that's yeah. how we do it. Yeah. Um, you can see the band sort of, you, you'd be hard pressed to see the number, um, yeah. but it's sort of enough for us at this point just to see recaptured birds. Yeah. We're not sort of, um, it's hard to sort of try and manage the numbers that way because we don't know what sort of numbers we're working yeah. with. Um, so yeah, the leg band number has been enough for us. And um, yeah, the Australian Bird Banding Authority is sort of the one that manages that. So you can, they, they know every bird that I've banded, um, you know, down to the sex, weight, size. Um, and then so you can send them, I found, you know, B124 or whatever. Um, and they'll say, oh, that's Susky of Plains Wanderer. It was first caught in Pulkamata. It was this weight and whatnot. So yeah, there's a lot of things like uh, programs like that that really help bird banders and help us sort of try and get understanding of our data and where our birds are off to. I love that ABBA is involved. It's always good. Yeah, when yeah. Involved. <laughs> it was uh, A B B B A. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you you don't take uh, you don't take any blood work when you cap capture them. No blood samples. Not at the moment. We're we're probably going to start looking at that for genetics. But at the moment, feather samples has been enough. So if you pluck a fresh feather, the the tip there has enough genetic sample in it for us to work with. Yeah. Um, any sort of shed feathers, usually not because they're, they're usually older and the, the DNA is degrading. But yeah, a fresh plucked feather, we um, pull it sort of from the flank of the bird. So, sort of, if you imagine sort of like, I guess, the armpit of it, you know, uh, of where like it's the, the, the underwing. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, not not under the wing, sort of like under its leg. So okay. kind of okay. like where there's yep. like fluffy bits that come yep. out there. Yeah. So we just pluck a few feathers out of there, um, and then yeah, just put that on ice and send it off to um, the the genetics team that sort of process that for us. So. Yeah, and that's been that's really we're really excited to actually see how that all goes. Like I mentioned before, we've not had a huge amount of South Australian birds included in the genetic sample, so we'll be really keen to see whether they do just fit in that melting pot or whether they are sort of a bit different. Okay. Um, regular reminder for those watching now: um, if you've got a question that I'm not, if I'm not covering something you want to know, just pop it in and I'll uh, I'll I'll bring it up. Uh, Saskia, how how many individuals have you been working with in in the population? How many birds do you know? It's and that's a million dollar question. So we've banded thirty three, um, which is we were really excited about. Um, I then went out without banding tools and equipment and whatnot, and we found quite a significant number more. Um, we also, when we're out banding, we found a number of males on chicks, so we don't touch males that are incubating yep. and we yep. certainly don't ban the chicks. So we don't have, because they're not all banded, we can't say 100% for sure, but we sort of are imagining the numbers sort of 50 plus, which is, uh, and perhaps even more again, um, which is really exciting because there was only meant to be 100 or so between South Australia, Queensland and sort of the periphery populations of New South Wales. So to think that we've got, you know, that many on, on a pretty small sort of section of properties makes you do wonder how many are actually about and whether, yeah, the population is, is um, doing well out here. It'd be better than we first thought. And how many have you been able to put, pop a harness on? Uh, I tracked 10 for my last project. So this was sort of one of those things where you just beat yourself up. When we first started doing recce out at the, the site I'm working on, we were finding like a bird or two, you know, where we there was not many out there. Um, so we sort of thought if we could get five birds tracked, happy days. So that was kind of enough for us. We didn't realise we were going to find the amount that we did. So we... Um, yeah, so we didn't get enough harnesses, so we had to do a, a double whammy. So we finished one batch, took them all off, and then did another batch again. Um, in my perfect world, probably would have been good to do a few more, but we're aiming to head out again on another field season um, next year when it cools down a bit out there to um, yeah try and get a few more tracks because yeah, the more we can understand about their home range, the, the better. Okay. This is a question so that people who aren't involved in in scientific research can get an idea of what is involved. So we briefly touched on getting ethical approval. So you've got to go through mm -hmm. through your faculty, through the university to get someone to tick off that, um, one, one, that it's not cruel and, and yes. that it's not going to damage the birds in any way, the mm -hmm. research that you do. Um, do you... Do you have to demonstrate to anybody other than your supervisor that the work is worthwhile, for want of a better uh, Yeah, term? so especially when you work with a critically endangered bird, there are a few hoops you need to jump through. And I, I think that is, is a really good thing. I think that should happen. You don't want just, you know, any Joe Blow or cowboys out there sort of just doing what they want with endangered animals. So... Um, certainly the ethics and the school needs a lot of input and to understand what you're doing. I work really closely with the um, Plains Wanderer Recovery Team, which is a program set up with a lot of the zoos, a lot of the researchers and scientists that are working on Plains Wanderer. Who, so, who's the chair of that now, just so if anyone wants to look it up? Um, All right, who, who, who's, who's, your, who's your inside contact on the recovery well, well, my like my, <laughs> my supervisor is on the, the panel, um, so... I can't think he's a chair at the moment. There's, um, yeah, there's a number of key players and there's people like Dave Parker and uh, David Baker Gab and whatnot are sort of the key names in sort of some of the, the research that's being done on Plains Wanderers at the moment. So they're, um, they're certainly on the panel and they, yeah, they have a lot of input as to what work they'd like to see done in South Australia and what work they're happy to support. And they were really great in sort of helping me out to um, train how to handle and work with Plains Wanderers. Um, so that sort of needs to happen. Zoos get a say in sort of how captive birds are being treated. There's a yeah, there's a number of different departments. Obviously, um, we have the sort of have to have a scientific research permit. So that's separate to the ethics to say that I'll be doing research on South Australian land. I need to get something from 
Uh, we call it sort of um, DEW, Department of Environment and Water. I think there's a different jurisdiction in each state, but they need to sign off on that work as well. There's, um, and then of course, Bush Heritage, which is the organization I do a lot of my work through, um, they approve some of the work I do as well. So yeah, it's never ending paperwork out here. Field work is, um, it's yeah, usually prefaced by quite a, quite a lot of um, background work and a lot of um, yeah, paperwork and whatnot. So, but it, yeah, I think it's a, it's, a frustrating process, but I think it is uh, definitely worthwhile and you know, good that we have those standards in place. It looks like the last update to the recovery plan was a uh, published update. I'm sure there's plenty of work being done uh, internally, but was 2016, is that? Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, that's, so that's, I think that was the last time that a review was sort of sent to you. The, yeah. That's what's it's, up on the uh, on the website anyway. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that's cool. Now, there's a question coming up in a minute, which we'll get to. So sit tight, Lama. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing it. Um, but before we, we do that, can you tell us a bit about the, the primary site that you've been working on and the linkage with Bush Heritage Australia so that we can talk a bit more about the global uh, work that they're doing at the location? Mm, yeah, so the site I work on is called Bulkamata Station Reserve. Um, it's an ex pastoral uh, property uh, that Bush Heritage has bought the pastoral lease for. So they, they manage and run that, that station as a conservation reserve. Uh, and that's sort of Bush Heritage's that's their gig. They they buy up uh, important parts of land in sort of Australia, uh, usually significant properties, either for size. Uh, species um, sort of yeah in context of making sort of a bigger environmental impact and they manage them sort of in a way that promotes conservation so the one in that I'm working on bulk matter was purchased because of plains wander abundance that was one of the key reasons that they wanted to buy that it's been identified as a international bird area of significance so IBA um, so that was one of the reasons that they were pretty keen to um, to get that and to manage it um, yeah, so that's that's sort of how they they run those programs. And and where where is it? Like, uh, give well, us an course, idea yeah. ge geographically <laughs> yeah. where where it is. So it fits in sort of what we call as like the northeast pastoral district in the semi-arid ranges of South Australia. So if you think of South Australia as a map, it's sort of yeah in the northeast corner there, very close to Broken Hill on the South Australian side. So um, yeah, Broken Hill's the sort of the closest town um but yeah it sort of fits into there's a, a network of properties out there um the way that sort of south australian land out there is sort of owned is it's people don't own that land they own the pastoral lease um and it's usually mainly used for like um yeah for stocking and uh, cropping and whatnot so um yeah so it's, it's part of those properties those networks up there so and yeah quite a big property off the top of my head i think it's like sixty four thousand hectares or something like that so um and it sort of takes up the plains where um plain funders live and then it also has a lot of range land on the uh more western side so we'll just get the uh the info up there so that people can see what the uh, what the landscape looks like and some of the other... Uh, oh, actually, there we go, Mad Max 2, just an hour away yeah. from where Mad Max 2 was. That's probably the way to describe what the plains look like. Like, if you've seen Mad yeah. Max, it's, yeah, that, that real barren open landscape. Yeah, and uh, just to uh, talk about some of the vegetation communities, as I was talking about earlier... Mulga woodland, bullock bush shrubland, freshwater wetlands, and river red gum woodlands. Um, the most of the plants that are being protected are vulnerable. So there's uh, Swainson peas, a wattle, a bell fruit, flax lilies, wilga, which is a wattle, uh, broom rape, and the Broughton pea. So that gives you an idea what's there. But in the animals, uh, birds, plains wanderer, white-winged fairy wrens, chirruping wedge, wedge bills, chestnut-crowned babblers, singing and spiny-cheeked honeyeaters, and the Australian pipit, nankeen or Australian kestrels, wedge-tailed eagles, masked wood swallows, orange and crimson chats, zebra finches, 
budgerigars, cockatiels, brown and rufous songlarks. So deserty without being that sandy desert um, that people often associate with. But in the Australian context, it's that typical dry country, uh, mulga and wilga would be the two um, sort of common words associated with that country, I think. Yeah. Am I, we also still I, get the, we call it like the kinopod plains, so sort of those those blue bush and salt bush plains. Um, yeah. That's sort of another important area for, for yeah. plains wanderers in particular. But, yeah, and, it's very much and there And they're areas that will flood, aren't they, that it really um, – not not terribly regularly, but but they're pretty flooded it, at the moment. Yeah, yeah the, um, that's right. The that's poor right. reserve that, manager that. out there I have to give a big shout out to him. He pulled me out of a few bogs this past field season. It is certainly pretty, um, yeah, pretty muddy, and uh, yeah, has had quite a bit of water on it over the past couple of months. That's for sure. Oh, I miss that. There's emus out there as well. Um, so. Are we allowed? We we we're probably allowed. This is a bush heritage, yeah. bush heritage uh, video. So let's um, let's let that run, uh, which will explain more about what bush heritage are doing, and no doubt there'll be some threads to pick up, and then we'll get to the point that uh, uh, that my aging friend Lama has talked about as well. So now c you can hear the audio, Saskia. Just make. I hear the audio. Yeah. Yes. So let's uh We don't want to see the plains wanderer go extinct. Australia has a very sorry history of mammal extinctions, the worst in the in the world, and we've got a lot of our fauna under equal threat. We can't afford to lose any more, not without putting up a, a big fight. If I ask somebody in the street what a plains wanderer was, it's more than likely they're not going to have any idea. They're a very cryptic bird, rarely seen, and they don't make the headlines. A plains wanderer is about 15 centimetres. They're sort of quail-like, but they're not actually related to quails. They're their own family, so they're really unique little critter. They're found in grassland habitat throughout Victoria and New South Wales and into South Australia. Plains wanderers do live here on Borkamata. In dry times, anecdotal evidence suggests that they do move on, and in the good seasons, they, they will come back again. Borkamata can provide a home for plains wanderers into the future. It does require a really good knowledge of how they utilise their habitat. The song meters installed on Borkamata are being used to work out how plains wanderers utilise the reserve. The song meter is a small device that has microphones and, and it can be programmed to record a frequency of a known target species. So in this instance, we're using it to monitor plains wanderers. The females have a call during breeding season that's at a particular frequency. And so we set these song meters up at the prime time for females calling. And it's a really non-invasive way of detecting the presence of plains wanderers in the landscape. Historically, surveys for this species have been using spotlight counts. And on a property of this scale, it's, it's really hard to cover the whole area. And also the bird is so cryptic and really well camouflaged. So using song meters is a great way to cover a lot bigger area and to expand our search for plains wanderers. We've got a great opportunity to, to put in some hard work and, and figure out a lot more about the species. With good on-ground management, control of predators and, and management of these grasslands, we can provide a place for, for plains wanderers in the future. I'll just let that run out. Uh, there we are, traditional owners uh, uh, acknowledged and there. And for the college, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was hoping that that would actually tell me who the who produced that. Obviously, thanks to Bush Heritage for I producing that. There was a lot um, of that, yeah. But I, I, I'd love to know who did the... Um, who did the cinematography? I wonder whether it was Nicholas Racatapare. Um, but that 
that was a really nice little film, wasn't it? And beautiful, yeah. Showed, showed off everything uh, really well. Um, the the question that um, uh, Wonder Lama had put into the comments was uh, the summary of it. I guess is. Do we know? Do we know historically? Have we collected any information from the indigenous communities uh, over the range of the uh, Plains Wanderer that is informing your work and any work going forward, or is that a is that a different project? Like, is that really something that somebody else with di- with different skills and and maybe different connections would be uh, would be taking up? Yeah, so Bush Heritage is one of their, their key focuses is trying to engage and work with local traditional owners. So that's something they're really passionate about. Um, there's not a huge amount of knowledge of Plains Wanderers that we know of in um, yeah, Indigenous communities, but there's um, there's a really great little um, draw, a cave painting of one that we believe is a Plains Wanderer. It's got like a little spotty sort of neck on it. So um, I think that was, I can't remember the exact location that was found. I believe it was somewhere in South Australia, but um. Yeah, so there, there was de- there's definitely knowledge of Plains Wanderers in Indigenous communities. Um, it's unfortunately something that we've not really been able to tap into enough. Um, I know a lot of the stuff that has been done in sort of the Eastern States is working really closely with that fire burning practice. So um, some of the stuff that they're working on is their grasslands get too dense for Plains Wanderers. They tend to leave these areas because they're too thick. So they're working with traditional owners to try and manage the grass um, sort of abundance and thickness using traditional methods of fire stick burning, which is just such an exciting um, practice and such a really cool way to sort of bring that knowledge into a project like this. So something we're really open to. And, yeah, it's, um, yeah we're um, really excited about the work they're doing and, yeah, hoping that we can sort of try and find similar connections and ways that we can involve that traditional knowledge into the work we're doing here. Is there a commonly applied indigenous name to the plain wanderer that you know of not that i know of um we struggle because we're on we're sort of on the edge of andamacha and widakali so um we don't know if they've got a, a a word or um but yeah it's something we'd be interested to know it's um i think that's one of the exciting things and lovely things about this sort of indigenous language is different groups have different language and um imagine there's a number of different words for it so it'd be it'd be really lovely to find that out and try and use that a bit more widely so yeah that would be yeah, a good thing to do and that's something we brought up um earlier on in one of the live streams we did talking about uh indigenous names and and n- applying any kind of common name to a bird and that it's only a common name if it's mm. wide, widely used and and widely known otherwise it's mm. not common you know yeah. um so yeah that's something that's going to be really exciting i think in the next phase of Australia's scientific uh, mm. awakening, I think, and the research that is done is sort of that crossover and using, because um, because in in times gone by we just did not collect any of that information because people just didn't value it. The no. scientific community, and 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 it's not a criticism of the individuals. Culturally, it wasn't something any of us. Uh, talked about i was thinking about this yesterday someone was talking about aussie what does it mean to be aussie and everything and and i looked back at some uh tv shows from the 60s and the 70s and we were so shit right i mean just be just because of what we accepted was important and who we viewed what was important and what we thought was historically important we're so different now in our outlook Mm. And that's got to feed the, through to, to science. Definitely. And I think the scientific community, yeah, is really encouraged and keen to sort of start to look at some of the ways that we can partner and sort of value a lot of this history uh, and bring it into the work that we're still doing now. There's like there's some of the traditional language words for birds are just lovely because a lot of them are based off the call. Like they're really intuitive. Um, and there's just some really lovely names out there. And I think it will be really nice to sort of see a lot of that in incorporated into the work we do and more into sort of just common culture so i think there's yeah like you say there's some nasty history and but i I look forward to sort of a better future in that and the way that we can support that in science and how we can sort of better the way that we do a lot of these practices definitely now that 
that film uh, showed one of the methods that crops up over and over and over again in the, the conversations that I'm having with researchers, and that's the soundscapes. Yes, so, we love them, yeah. Now, are you using uh, – is that project with the soundscapes up on um, uh, Bulkamata out aligned with, with your study? Like is there a, yeah. a, quite a lot of crossover or – yeah, so I've started managing that program now. So that's become part of my project, which is really exciting. So they set that up. The video that you showed was sort of um, set uh, a few, I think it was like 2017, 18, that they went and set all those up. Um, so we've got a really lovely backlog of data that was collected while Book Matter was in drought. And then in that, we've also got the really beautiful subsequent recovery. So, and we're able to map plane plunder calls over that time, which has been really exciting. So, um, yeah, the soil meters have just been a absolutely fabulous way for us to passively record their abundance and their behavior. Um, because we know a lot about their behavior, like we know that it's a female that calls, we know that she moves on to other ranges, we know a bit about their home range size, we can actually infer a lot about monitoring their calls, which is a really cool way for us to try and, like, again, sort of try and monitor these birds without getting in their face too much. So there's some really cool technology that I'm really lucky to be able to use and, yeah, we're really excited to see where it goes. Can't resist a plug. Um, if you're interested in the soundscape technologies and how it's being used, go back and um, have a look and listen listen or watch the conversation I had with uh, Dr. Dave, Professor Dave Watson from Charles Sturt University. And um, I'll be leaving some out, but also the seabird, so um, seabird soundscapes uh, with Alini uh, who's based in, in the UK, where she's analysing recordings taken at sea of seabirds to, um, well, go back and listen. Go back and listen to that one. Uh, it's becoming a really important tool because it's cost effective. Um, what I wanted to ask you about that, now that you're managing it, collecting the recordings is passive, and much yes. easier. You just go and uh, take the sound card out and then you bring the sound card back. How are you doing yes. the analysis? How much of that is AI and machine learning and how much yeah. of it is an individual actually listening to the files, the sound files? Yeah, so we've, we've got about 30 song meters out at the moment and they've been collecting data since 2018. They collect for an hour in the morning and an hour at night, all day, every day. So you can imagine that's quite a huge backlog of data and also just a huge incoming amount of data. So um, yeah, back in the day we used to sort of, I think people used to go through it manually, but now we've got a really cool tech that we can use. So we use what's called like a planes on a recognizer, which is yeah. a, a sort of a call file that's made up of a number of planes on recalls. And then we can run that through the calls that we have and um, yeah, use nifty programs that just sort of run through it uh, and then they spit out at the end. They say, we think this is Plains Wonder. And then I and can then, go through rather than going through however many hundreds of hours. Of, of hours, calls, yeah. You can go and listen to three hours of stuff. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they, and the calls look quite distinctive as well when you look at them sonically. So you can sort of sit there like a series yeah. of little lines. Um, so you can even visually do it. You don't have to sit there with earphones and go, oh, I'm not sure if I can hear it or not. It's quite a low frequency call and the song meter is better at picking up the call than I am at hearing them um, because they do sit so low frequency. So quite often I can see the call, uh, but I can't always hear it. So, um, yeah, it's a really good tech and it's a really – yeah, great way of analysing it. it. makes my life a lot easier. It's certainly cut down a lot of um, processing yeah. hours for me, so I'm very thankful for that. Yeah, and, and the consumer software that's available now so that you can analyse either the traditional waveforms that I think most mm -hmm. people are uh, familiar with, but then there's also lot more like a heat map representation that's available too so it's much easier to pick out the frequencies of the call just by scanning through quickly um yep. a, a, you know a half an hour or so of recordings rather than having to listen to them so uh it's so that's it good. takes me more, more time to upload the files like as far as size that, and you know yeah. it takes me longer to do that than it does to actually go through and go that's plain or that's plain or that isn't so it's yeah it's um yeah, yeah the text fabulous where we're at at the moment it's really exciting yeah and 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 then it gives you the opportunity once you've collected the data is that you can then 
crowdsource some of it if you if you need to, uh, which is what Alini was doing um, because there were so many species of seabirds. It was it's much harder to write an algorithm for seventy species rather than one target species. So yeah, she um, crowdsourced it, uh, which yeah. was really really cool. Um, Victorian teams do some cool stuff with that, doing some citizen science programs. So yeah, it's really good what you can do. Yeah. So what what's next with your part of the the, the project? And and I mean, you're taking on the audio portion of it, the audio mm-hmm. monitoring. Um, is that an extra? Like, is that an extra role? And and the reason I'm asking is because I'm always banging on about how hard it is to get funding to continue um, the work you're doing. So does does that enable you to move from, like, the, the study that's university-based but continue doing that work, moving it into sort of ongoing funding with, with BHA? Mm. So the, the stuff that I'm doing with the song meters has become part of the PhD. So I was um, very lucky that Bush Heritage and the ecologists there were happy for me to take that data set that was mostly unanalyzed and use it as part of this project. Um, so analyzing that does sort of, is really part of this project and sort of me trying to um, answer some of those questions that I talked about earlier. Um, but yeah, it's, um, I guess it's endangered species ecology is always one of those never ending things. So yeah, I hope mm. that at the end of this project, it's not just a, another dead end for South Australian research. I think I would hope that be another student after me or a postdoc or um, it gets incorporated into like a, um, a department sort of program because it's, um, yeah, when we sort of have these critically endangered birds, especially in, in ranges and that we don't quite understand, I think any sort of ongoing monitoring is really important to try and manage them better and ensure these populations are, are supported the best we can. So, yeah, I'd like to I'd like to hopefully see it on go. Bush Heritage has been absolutely phenomenal. I can't thank them enough for all the support they've given me and the support they've given this project. So this project was their um, their 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 baby, their idea, and something they wanted to support. So. I would imagine that, yeah, even after this project, it will continue on through through their work. Yeah, Bush Heritage do really, really critically important work in Australia. Mm-hmm. And now, this is no criticism of Bush Heritage Australia, but the very fact that they have to be as important as they are just highlights how shit the government is doing at 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 this either. stuff. Like how how they've governments have. All colours, you know, over 20 years have wound back their involvement in protecting endangered species and endangered vegetation communities and, mm. and the geographic locations and just outsourced it to NGOs, which it's, is, yeah, is it's, dumb. It's, it's, it's dumb ridiculous. because it relies on – it makes the funding so precarious, you know. And it, it's – it, it's double-sided, I guess. I mean, one of the, it, yeah, the, the system is um, tragically underfunded and, yeah, it's difficult to do research under these sort of the ways that we have this set up. And I guess one of the nice things about having a lot of this held in the hands of NGOs is that it's not dependent on government funding. So if we do have a change of government that has a change of priorities, that has a change of where they want to outsource these things to, those programs don't die, which is, I think, something that's really lovely about these, a lot of the NGOs that exist in Australia. Mm-hmm. Um, it's lovely that these can be ongoing projects, but yeah, all of them are, um, I, yes. I, I, I totally fun. agree with you on that because that, that work is necessary and that's where the really niche and, uh, you know, let's go off in that direction kind of work should happen. But we've allowed governments, because Bush Heritage and, and you know, so many other organisations have become very strong, it's allowed the governments to say, well, we don't need to do anything. They're doing it, which, yeah. which is the problem. We should have a dual track thing. And, and actually, the institutions, the universities should be doing their own stuff too. We should have three strains at least of research funding and and aims uh, and but we but we don't we've lumped it all into you know the government have just said oh well we don't need to do anything on planes wanderer because bush heritage have got that under control right or which is just so dumb because the minute we have a interest rate crisis 
you know, and people can't afford their mortgages, the government just say, well, what do we do? We'll take all the money out of conservation. No one really gives a shit. And Bush Heritage have got that under control. And at the same time, they'll cut the they'll cut the grants to all the NGOs by ten or fifteen percent. You know, it's yeah. just dumb uh, to my yeah. to my mind. It just 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 you know, here I, I'm on my soapbox here. It just displays a total lack of commitment right through government. All the governments, all the all the colours, all the states, they all do it, and it's dumb, in my view. So, yeah. No, it's, it's hard to get work done when there's no funding. Yeah, certainly a yeah. lot of these projects, yeah, rely on, um, yeah, the generosity, like as you saw in the video of, um, you know, private philanthropy and um, grants from, yeah, different projects. And there's just, there's a lot of us fighting for scraps and a lot of us competing with our peers for the funding, which is equally important. And it's, yeah, it is, it does hinder a lot of research. There's, um, yeah, there's a real, an unfortunate gap in, um, yeah, Australian conservation research and the funding that's required to do it. Yeah, I mean, we, we go over it in every show about uh, everyone's trying <laughs> to get trying to get money, and, and 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 then it means that your your project is competing against some other really necessary project. You know yeah. that 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 Bush Heritage might only have enough funding to, uh, you know, in their pot to do 10, 10 yeah. um, projects, but there's. 50 needed to be done, you know, and yeah. you, you've got the birds competing against the frogs, competing against the desert peas, competing against the rock wallabies. And then on top of that, you know, a lot of, you know, soil work that is, you know, that, critically yeah. important, but, you know, nowhere yeah. near as, yeah. I, I yeah, no, so, that. um, yeah. I mean, we, we really need to be putting more money in rather than trying to find ways to save money, um, but anyway, that's just that's just me and my my grumpiness. Um, again, uh, uh, putting a call out to the audience there. If you've got a question or a comment, or there's something I haven't asked that you think needs to be asked, um, here's an opportunity to do it. Uh, oh, good old Lama's jumped in again. Uh, oh, don't get me started. Fair income. Um, new government. Tanya Plibersek might listen better to the last lot. Okay. My soapbox, you can step back from this, Saskia, if you don't want to have a uh, bar of it. Yes. Um, the, 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 the way they are merging carbon and biodiversity offsets into a scheme that probably won't work is insane. They've had nine years to do something good, They're sitting back, and what they've done is it's like which, which kind of dog shit would you like to step in? Really stinky dog, dog shit or, or stinky dog shit? I, I don't I don't get it. I've got no faith. And actually, here, let here's my chance. Up above my head, Queensland Environment Minister. No. There. <laughs> Queens Queensland Planning Minister and Deputy Premier and Federal Minister for Conservation. Uh Toonda Harbour. That development is still uh likely to go ahead unless we all get going. So that's their Twitter handles. You can, through their Twitter profiles, you can find their Facebook and everything. Um, it really makes a difference if you write a, a an actual letter rather than stop Toonda, right? That's, that's noise. Write them a letter and say you actually care and that your vote may be dependent on what they do. I mean, for crying out loud, Bob Brown got arrested. The... Uh, was it yes, the day before yesterday? Bob Brown got arrested trying to stop them harvesting swift parrot habitat. Swift parrot breeding habitat. Hello? You know, she didn't do anything to stop the, the development in known Gordian habitat in, northern, in the Northern Territory. Sorry, Lama, I've got absolutely no faith in the change of government unless they actually demonstrate when they do the um uh the the review that the the new legislation uh unless that's radically different than what we've got now pfft, rubbish anyway there's my soapbox i'm done with that um good to get it off your chest <laughs> no but 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 it's one of the frustrations I have, Saskia. Actually, I'd be interested in your thoughts on this without looking at a particular issue. But we're existing now in 
I, I mean, look, no, I can't get off the particular issue. Did anyone see the tweet that went out yesterday where um, Albanese put the tweet out, I think, yesterday, saying, now, he's not at COP27. He didn't go, right? So it wasn't important enough for the Prime Minister to go, but the Prime Minister put out with Chris Bowen a graphic about we've signed up to the global um, initiatives to protect our forests, right? And guess what the graphic was? Cartoons of pine trees and fir trees. So they couldn't even put the effort in to have their comms team in Australia to produce something that's about Australian forests. Um, yeah, so there we are. Bowen is going tomorrow. Yeah, but Bowen's not the Prime Minister, right? And that's my point, that, that it's important, but it's not important enough for the Prime Minister to fly over there. And that's what pisses me off. I think they're just doing the absolute bare minimum to look like they're doing something, which is the problem. Everything is about PR and promoting marketing, about the feeling, the feeling we're doing something. So far, Tanya Plibersek has done not one thing to ensure the, the survival of any um, endangered species. And people say, be fair, it's only, they've only just come in. They've had nine years to work on this policy. And this is the policy that can't wait, right? Mm -hmm. If they do something in 18 months' time, will it be too late for the swift parrot? Because the extinction doesn't happen. Oh, they cut the forest down today and they're extinct next year. No, what they're doing now means that they're extinct in 15 years, but it's not reversible, right? Or do we accept that the good place to see koalas is in a zoo, right? That's, that's the norm. They're normalising all this. All their press conferences have been in zoos, right? Tanya Plibersek didn't go out anywhere to do her PR, about the offsets and everything. She went to a bloody zoo. They're actually normalising the fact that it's okay, there's always going to be koalas, you'll always be able to go and get your photo taken with a koala. Don't panic. Don't panic. That's why I'm so angry about it and why I never, ever will give up on this until I do something about it. Anyway, there we go. Saskia, what, have I, what haven't I asked you that I should have asked you about? Um <laughs> what's the next step for you in your project let's get back to yeah. you that's enough about me <laughs> no i enjoyed your answer it's good to yeah, <laughs> say these things um yeah i think so I'm, I'm at the very start of my phd so i'm really just sort of yeah looking at the next couple of years coming up doing some pretty intense field work trying to understand better some of the movement of these birds, some of the behaviours, uh, understand the birds that they're living in. So I've got some big long nights ahead of me and some yeah, some uh, tough days out in the field. So that's sort of what we're we're looking at next. And then just of course just a, a lot of data analysis and crunching numbers and hopefully getting the research out there so that it's uh, available for everyone. Um, so yeah, that's sort of the, the next plan for me. We're heading out again next uh, autumn uh, to do another a tracking period and another uh, leg banding period to try and get a better idea of the populations and uh, yeah, how far these birds are moving. So yeah, it's all, when, all exciting. When you say we, um, hmm. who who's we? Like, what's the team, and what are the what are the others in the team working on? I'm guessing. You clarify for me that mm. there's maybe somebody working on vegetation, maybe someone working on on reptiles or or something, and you all get together and support each other's work. Or, yeah. So, or is there is there a planes wander a team? There's uh, my project is sort of like I I manage a lot of it and do most of the legwork for my project with a, a series of volunteers and um, field workers and helpers that come out and um, help me do long nights and help spotlight these birds for me and all that. So that's been brilliant. Um, I work really intense with the ecologists that we have at Bush Heritage. So um, they support the work that, that we're doing and um, try and get a lot of um, yeah support through that. Uh, but yeah, like we sort of, we're talking about earlier bush heritage isn't like i mean 
in South Australia or it will come out of their focus isn't just Plains Wanderers. That's just the project that I'm working on. There's a yeah a heap of um, projects that are being happening up at Bulkamata Station. So they've got yellow of rock wallabies, which is a lot of work um, happening there. And the um, uh, the reserve managers are working on soil conservation projects and there's a lot of vegetation work happening. So there's, yeah, there's always, whenever I go to Bulkamata and do my field work, there's always a team of about four or five other people working on completely unrelated projects. Um, so it's a really cool way to meet other people and get to hear about the, the broader sphere of biology. And it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a, a great place to work and it's a really exciting sort of uh, de- uh, company to work for just because of that element and the, the constant um, research that's coming out of it. It's really, really exciting. Well, let's be clear. It's not a company. It's a trust. It's a charitable trust. Um, yeah, it's governed yeah. governed by all those yeah, rules. Yeah. Better, better yeah. word. Yeah, um, which which means it's able to attract uh, tax deductible donations. Uh, mm. Now, I think that was uh, bushheritage.org.au slash donate. Yeah, so, so uh, they yeah, so it's um, if you can, it's a really good uh, cause to uh, to support. And look, I'll just put it out there: I've been trying to talk to some of the bush heritage projects that are focused on the indigenous land land management techniques at some mm-hmm. of the other other sites. So hopefully, I'll be able to talk a lot more about bush heritage um, Australia over the next. Um. Well, maybe next year. When when will you be able to update more, Saskia? Like, if we want to talk Plains Wanderers again, wouldn't it be mm-hmm. good to get you and Dan in in yeah. the same set of windows and maybe I mean, talk about what? As I said, there's a team that's starting up in uh, Queensland as well, starting to do some research there. So they also have a periphery population that we, we don't know much about. So, yeah, it'd be cool to get a yeah a crew together, talk Plains Wanderers Australia. Is that out of UQ? Like, Yes. Yeah, so yeah, there's, okay. um, I think... So is, is that out of UQ, James, James Watson's lab, maybe? I'm trying to think who's running it at the moment. I think it's a pretty department-led as well. So I think okay. QUT, uh, the, and I think they're going to get a student on their project pretty soon. So there oh, cool. should be some research coming out of there as well, which is really exciting. So, yeah, okay. um, I mean, ground, ear to the ground, and, yeah, hopefully there will be new research soon. Excuse, excuse me while I write that on the uh, on on the whiteboard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is how it's done, folks. <laughs> QUT Plains Wanderers, okay, because it's very very hard to keep up with everything that's going on when you're not getting yeah. when you're not in a university faculty and getting all that all that it's stuff. When you're in a university faculty, well, <laughs> yeah, there's. Look, there's so much. There is so much to, to get going. Um, actually, there's a good opportunity. If you've got a tip or you've got something that you would like me to chase up, um, news at thebirdemergency.com. That goes to the mailbox where I look for little tidbits and whatnot. So, yeah, do that. Um, the, uh, the last thing I really want to ask Saskia is um, when... Uh, when do you, uh, well, what do you plan to move on to after the PhD? Like, have you got a long term plan? Uh, this question. Well, well I, I, look, I know it's really hard because it's like yeah. three years, possibly four years of grind. And yeah. I mean, let's uh, let's be clear. Um, what are you on? A, are you getting a stipend of like twenty grand a year or something? Yeah, I'm on a, a, a stipend. Yeah, so yeah, so um, so for those going. so for those of you in the audience, when's the last time you existed on twenty grand a year? Right. So just how good are two minute noodles? <laughs> well, that's why I'm always saying you guys are the bloody heroes of the conservation movement, right? Because because to do it, that means for three maybe four years. You are living like you did in first year uni when you were living at mum and dad's, right? You know, I, right? No, so I'm just trying to get people to understand. If you think back, if you're as old as me, think back to what you were doing in 1984, 1985. And if you were 
living in a share house with five or six people. Would you do that now? Because that's what you kind of need to contemplate if you're going to do a PhD. So I'm, yes. or, or you get to live under mum and dad and hopefully mum and dad aren't like the crazy parents that you see on all the TV shows, you know, while you're under my house, you do un live under my rules. So um, well, my, my, my parents are, um, yeah, we've, my, my mum's in, up at uh, Bonbon Station, which is one of the Bush Heritage Reserves. So it's all a bit in the family here. So um, yes. Cool. So yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, like, it's a pretty greater point. Yeah, it is, um, yeah, students do uh, do have it tough. But I think a lot of it comes from a place of passion. Like, we're all incredibly passionate about our projects and incredibly passionate about the research that we're able to contribute and how that might help uh, form better management, form better understanding of these species. And, um, yeah, to me, it's, it's a really important thing. And, um, yeah, I guess if you look at it that way, like, you know, a sacrifice that you're willing to make because it's, it, yeah, it's really important to me. So, um, yeah, it's, yeah, we, um, yes, I mean, that's the, the general student sort of issue. But, uh, yeah, after this, I guess, you sort of look at things like postdocs and other research that you might be interested in getting into and, yeah, different ecology positions. It's um, it's exciting to see how open the world is to you after you do a PhD, though. So as much as you do, you do suffer through the, um, the years of study, uh, there is a, yeah, sort of like a light at the end of the tunnel. There's a lot of opportunities at the end. So let me draw again, labouring the point on one of my crazy, loopy analogies. Do we really want our conservation policy within the country to be based on the passion of researchers and the goodwill of researchers? Do we want our conservation policies to be run like a footy cheer squad? Which is kind of what we're doing, you know. We want these people to go all over the the country and sleep out and do this and provide it's your vehicle right uh no bush heritage helps me out and oh. the uni also helps out as well so yeah like okay it's, good um, yeah i don't but want to the, make like a super no 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 no, no no but the but the government didn't give you like 20 grand to to maintain and run your vehicle for the period of the project right Yes, no, that is, but, yeah. And there's but they did give it, to, give it to the person who produced that stupid fucking artwork over the weekend, right? So that's my point. <laughs> that's, yeah. That's, yeah. that's my point, is that pulling, uh, it's like pulling teeth for really important work. But, hey, we need a new whiz-bang photocopier, not a problem. I'm sure they've got plenty of them. Uh, anyway, anyway, that's enough. Um, Saskia? Where do you place yourself in the uh, in the bird nerd spectrum? Are you a bird person, or have you become? A, are you a plant or animal person who's got involved just because the plane planes wander a project cropped up? Tell us about. Yeah. You, question, tell us about yeah. your relationship with birds. <laughs> What sort of twitcher are you? Yeah, so I'm. Um, yeah, I, I would call myself a bird nerd. Yeah, I. I wanted to do a PhD that was birds. That was pretty important to me. Um, I yeah, no, I keep a list, and I'm pretty pretty adamant about it. Like I'm sure a lot of your listeners are. So yeah, no, definitely a, a pretty keen birder. Um, but in that also, like I love vegetation and sort of looking at the um, the how we can look at birds to sort of understand a greater environment because I think birds are they are a really cool animal because we can understand them really well. Like they use a lot of like like mammals use a lot of like smells and things and scents that we can't always see and perceive as sort of, you know, humans observers looking. Um, but with birds, we can understand them a lot better uh, and a lot of their behaviours make sense to us and it's a really easy way for us to sort of look at them and understand an environment and understand, um, yeah, what's missing and how we can help improve it. So, yeah, I, I think yeah, I've always been fascinated with birds since I was a kid. Um, and yeah, I guess just sort of, this was sort of, yeah, always was sort of going to head into a, a bird based project. Now you said you keep a list. I sure do. What's your number? Oh, no, I don't keep numbers and I'm really, oh, I'm all right. Really, well, that's, that's a key so point. Funny about my list. Like, I, I love talking to people about their list so much because everyone's got such a strict set of rules and I love it. Like. So I have to see the bird properly. Like I can't just like see it. So I went up to Queensland really briefly and I like saw your coals and I was like really excited about it, but I didn't get to see them properly. So I won't put them in my list. So I'm like, I'm really picky about it. Like, okay. I'm, so, yeah. so, so you won't, 
you don't accept for yourself auditory evidence. Like if you know the call oh, no. and you hear it, you don't you yeah. don't accept that. To, okay. And I can't like I can see a bird, but then I have to like get a good look at it as well. Like I can't just sort of like see it fly by and yeah, know yeah. what I'm, it is. Yeah, that, yeah, that, that, I, I've been birds for a while, so I've got a relatively good idea of what I'm looking at. But um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm very picky about my list. I'm, yeah, yeah that, I, I just think it's, I think it's brilliant. Like, I love everyone's different rules that they have for each themselves and how they, yeah, they keep their list, how different people like format it. I've seen the most amazing Excel spreadsheets of how people keep where and when and what they saw. So yeah, I'm just, I, I think it's brilliant. Such a a cool little thing that we've invented oh. as a birding community. It's one of the most interesting things about birding or birds in general is how how people uh, go about the activity. I'm a little bit different to you I, in that I will definitely I, – I reckon the other day I saw a particular honey eater, a group of them, and yeah. I, I saw them moving through but I didn't hear them. Mm. I, but I didn't get a close enough look for me to be able to write in a notebook what yeah, I definitely. saw, yeah. so that doesn't count. But if I heard a call that I knew, I mm. would tick it. I, I would put it in. Yeah. But I don't actually keep a list, right? But but mm. I will let auditory information support what I see visually. But now I have different got- rules for different. So if I'm doing like I do a lot of bird surveys for work, um, and I'm really happy to do like a bird survey and hear a call and count it there i'm okay yeah. with some of my calls so i'm happy to do that but yeah for my own list no no like yeah, uh, yeah. So, it's yeah i guess you just have to have your own rules for it but yes uh how about taking photos like record photos yeah i'm happy with that yeah that's what, where yeah. i started so i mean i think I, I think it's a lot of place where a lot of birders start it's quite overwhelming to try and find those minute details especially in the field so yeah i started sort of taking you know this horrendous blurry pictures of trying to work out key diagnostics and then you'd go back home and you go no no it had, had the white stripe on its eyebrow and so that makes yeah. sort of this that so yeah and i think that's a, a really good tool especially when you were beginning i think it's almost um yeah required these days it's um yeah, yeah, it's, yeah it seems to be part of the the standard birding backpack so how did you get into birding and and like were, were you like me as a kid were you lying on the floor of the lounge room when you were six or seven with your set of derwents or cumberland uh, uh pencils you know drawing yellow robins you know yeah yeah and then um yeah definitely like flicking through the bird book so i was I've been really lucky to have parents that have brought me up with birds, um, you know, and a very much an interest in nature. So I remember like being, I don't know, eight or nine and then school holidays and mum was, would set us little like tasks. Like she'd be like, okay, so for today you're going to make a bird guide of all the different birds that you can see at home. So like we'd go out and be like, ah, oh, look, it's like a, 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 a red rump parrot. And we'd like write it down like, oh, we saw it near the, you know, the grasses and we'd be, you know, so, yeah, that's definitely sort of what, what became a, a point for us. And then, you know, because my parents had that interest, they sort of would um, instill that on me. They'd point out the birds that they knew. And, yeah, it's sort of just been one of those natural things that you just, you're always aware of that. Um, so it just becomes very much part of your worldview and your life. So two things. Coolest mum ever. Okay, let's just get that. <laughs> let's just get that out there. Um, I love that. <laughs> She'll be like smiling. <laughs> but you, but you mentioned red rump parrots. So, if you're a kid who was into red rumps and your mum was into red rumps, mm-hmm. have you been contributing to Rob's red rumpury project? Oh goodness, no. Oh, oh well, hang on, Uh-oh. hang on. <laughs> no, 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 hang on. Let, no, no, this just let, gives me an opportunity to pop this up. Um, there we are. Citizen Science Pro- Project Red Rump Red Rumpury. Re- so that's your homework, Saskia. You're going off to check out what like Red Rumpury is. Uh, the Bird Emergency dot com slash Red Rumps will take you to Red Rumpury. And that Rob is mapping all the known, and that's going back historically. Mm-hmm. Um, red rump net, red, red rump nesting locations. So if you remember oh. from your childhood with your mum, re, a red rump nest hollow somewhere. Rob wants to know where it is, when it was, 
and so that's that project. So that I couldn't let that move on. Um, what's your field guide of choice? And you can go Ooh. historical here if you've moved from one to another. Mm. Tell us about no, that. No, I've always, and I think I will always be a Morecambe's girl. Um, okay. I have the same Morecambe's that I was using when I was a kid. And this book, I should have actually had it here next to me. It is so bashed up. It is just, I don't know what I'm going to do with it. So it is like the, the front cover is just falling apart. Falling it's off. Actually yeah. such, oh, it's such an old guide that it has things like uh, the Night Parrot is still written in as extinct as so, extinct yeah or, po or possibly <laughs> extinct <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, God. yeah um but i love it and like i um like i was saying like i don't keep numbers because i just write in the guide where yeah, what yeah, i see yeah, yeah. details so um yeah this this poor book is just absolute and i've like spilt water all over it's been bashed up in my backpack like i don't know what i'm gonna do if it ever falls apart i'll be a i'll be a mess but yeah what, i've um, what? Yeah, brought with them so yeah been a fan oh. ever since what you do is you get on eBay and you find the, uh, a used copy of the same edition and just mm. buy that. <laughs> so. yeah, just sit there and transfer all. Right? <laughs> yeah. Know, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Um, uh, my field guide that I loved dearly as I was growing up, um, volume one of Peter Slater's um, Field Guide to Australian Birds, got mm. destroyed yeah. a, a, along with my Reader's Digest every Australian yeah. bird illustrated uh, yeah. when when where I was camping and I went camping on my own as a oh, must have been 15 maybe uh, 14 15 on a family property Acheron River flooded uh, I was asleep when it came up over me don't camp on river flats that I learned no. that um, <laughs> but yeah destroyed my bird books and and and, and my little eyepiece that I used to look at flowers oh, and everything right. and my binoculars so I learned that lesson in a very painful way because yeah, no, very, cool. very expensive it, well at that age very very significantly yeah. expensive um, but I've yeah. certainly sat with a hair dryer with mine. Like I've, yeah. Oh, stuck together. That horrible when you pull oh, them apart and, and you. Pages are all wobbly. I know. I and... should just give up and put on, but I can't. And then like I take it out. I do a lot of bird banding. And I take the um, book out with me, so it's covered in bird scat as well. From, yeah. Um, banding. So it's like it's not a pretty book. Like whenever people see it, they're like, ooh. <laughs> no, but uh, uh, bloody amazing. I reckon that's great. So all right. So the you're you're a Morecambe girl, um, Morecambe but. Girl. But I'm guessing that you do have one of those. I think we all have one of those, don't yes, we? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, gee, it's heavy, isn't it? Ha um, it's I'm, not a field guide. You don't bring that in the field with you. Yeah. It's a, yeah but it's a but book. of course they have they have put out the red one, the concise one, so um, yes. which yeah. is more of a field guide. Um, bucket list bird. Oh, so many, so many. Like night parrot, like like just speaking of them then that was that's pretty high up there oh i could go on like i've just yeah have you had a close encounter with a night parrot like have you have no. you, you, so you haven't turned up somewhere where someone says oh you should have been here last wednesday <laughs> was, yeah. i think we've all got birds like that yeah um no i haven't had that with night parrots which is yeah so there's some out on a couple of bush heritage reserves up in queensland so i'm trying to sort of shoulder my way in there but um yeah there's um there's some great research being done on them but oh i just yeah all the birds are amazing mally uh not mally yeah mally emu wrens is sort of pretty high up on my list as well they're now pretty much extinct from south australia so that'd be a cool one to see there's, and um, how, oh, how amazing is that that those two yeah. birds i just happen to have an episode on both of those so there we go <laughs> what a good segue for you it's like we planned this <laughs> Uh, yeah, and that South Australian population is the uh, one of the ones that um, Simon Verdon was was uh, working on. Yes. So yeah, yeah so yeah. that that's what the Mallee Emu Wren uh, uh, population is uh, um, episode is about. So, any other sort of bucket list top of your bucket list uh, there? Oh, I should have had. No, off the top of my head. I haven't done a lot of like Western Australia yet, so I really need to get a lot of just those sort of the common ones over there as well. So, yeah, 
I go through my list slowly. I think like as a as a younger birder, I sort of think, oh, this is I, I don't want to I want to have this as a hobby that goes on for a while. You know, I don't want to pick them all off too quickly and then have nothing to do. You know, later in life. So I'm just getting through it slowly. Um, as as they come, I don't try and rush it or push it. Yeah, just when when it's right, when you when you're in the right place in the right time and you see them, it's yeah. I think that's makes it more exciting too. I just checked my Twitter messages and Wonder Llama. Um, just sent me a Twitter message and showing that eBird uh, has one record of the Plains Wanderer in South Australia, and it is it looks like it's perhaps around Murray Bridge, maybe mm-hmm. Narracorty kind of area. So, so there was uh, yeah, there's been a couple of signings around there. eBirds actually um, they don't place recent Plains Wander sightings because they're so rare they don't pin them. So, um, yeah, there's a, I think there's a few people that have put recent sightings in. They obviously have that data, but it's not um, publicly accessible. Um, yeah. We, As much as we, we love birders, they do come in droves when they find that there's a, a good Plains Wanderer location. So, yeah, I think, um, I think yeah, eBird sort of puts a bit of a, a limit onto the more rare that, birds. Of, that's you know, right. And... and- and Zeno Canto of uh, the same as well. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's. I mean, that's one of the great bugbears that I have. I'm a real casual birder, in terms yeah. of that that twitcher mentality. That's just not where I'm at. I'll go and look. I'll go and sit in the park and watch red wattle birds all day because they're so yeah. interesting. And I don't know if you've been following my exploits or my reporting on my local magpie family after. The male, the male I found dead on a, nice. uh, and and today there's a new male. Mm. There's a new male. Still in the picture. Uh, but he seems to be submissive to the one of the females. A- another female moved in to help the the existing female, another mature female. It's a really weird <laughs> dynamic that I'd never heard of before. So, uh, really cool research on magpie social behaviour. They're just. They're a really cool bird. Like, you know, and like you say, like a bird that everyone can just watch out their back window and get a bit of an understanding of bird behaviour and dynamics. That they're a really cool species for that. And yeah, we're really lucky to have them so accessible to us. Yeah, so I've got to follow up a lot more on the on the Australian magpie research. Um, mm. I kind of I didn't I didn't chase it down so much at the beginning of the show because endangered, you know sort of wanted to focus mostly on critically endangered birds. So we're moving more into that urban birds enjoying yeah. bird watching thing. So let, let let me let let me tackle the bucket list location for you. What's mm-hmm. what would be your bucket list location? It, it, is it uh, the night parrot in in like the Channel yeah. Country of Queensland? Is that kind of oh, where you would want to go? Christmas Island and all that, okay. like, because yeah. that's pretty yeah. high up on my, yeah, I think a lot of the offshore islands are pretty high up on my my bucket list locations. Like, just what incredible places just to see, like, huge endemic, anim- uh, you know, numbers and, yeah, just really unusual birds. So, yeah, uh, like Lord Howe Island and, um, yeah, a lot of those sort of ones in Bass Strait are pretty pretty high up on my list to get out to. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, or, or Macquarie. How about Macquarie? Yeah. That would be pretty cool. Yeah, or sa- oh South Georgia. You know, yeah. so many places. Uh, yeah, uh, best bird. What's the best bird? The plains wanderer. <laughs> 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 what sort of question is that? Well, no. I just have to. I just have to put it out there. So yeah, no, um, I, they are. I mean, I'm so biased, but they are the coolest bird. Like, <laughs> the weirdest bird. I don't know if that counts for anything. They're a really wacky bird, but um, yeah, I think they're just. Every time I see them, I'm just always just like so smitten with them. I'm like, oh yes, you are such a cool little bird. They look really weird, and their behaviours are really unusual. And they head bob and they run around, and, you, and to have them in their hand as well, they, they're quite an unusual looking bird. Close up, like their their eyes are bright yellow, um, and but their pupils are like unusual shape. They're not like a circle. They're kind of like a blob. Yeah. The first time I, I held one, I thought I'd like squeezed it too hard or something horrible would happen. Like they're just a really unusual bird to see and like and, work with. So, yeah, and anamorphic eyes. Yep. Um, yeah, yeah. Freak me so, out the first time I saw them. So bushheritage.org.au is where you can check out um, what Bush Heritage is doing. 
Saskia, mm. where can people track you on social media or something? Yeah, I don't have a huge social media presence. If your listeners are interested, I do keep a sort of an Instagram updated of sort of some of the stuff I've been up to. Um, just okay. Just, just send, the, you, send me, you send me that. I'll put that in the post if if yep. people want to check that out. That's cool. The Bush Heritage is really good. They put um, – so, like, they have uh, the newsletters that come out and whatnot, and they put a lot of my research updates in there. So their Bush Tracks has just come out as of, like, a couple of weeks ago. So there's a little update of my research on there. And they're really good at updating, like, their, their social medias. They're a lot better than I am. Um, so, yeah, keep on track with them. And, yeah, you do tend to get my, my research trickle in through there. Terrific. Well, um at Bird Emergency is me, and that's also on Mastodon now and that on Twitter. Um, just check later on. I'll have all the, the links. Saskia will send me what she needs to or wants to, which will be very, very, very cool. Uh, last chance in the peanut gallery. If you have a question or a comment uh, before we sign off, while we're waiting just for a minute, Saskia, thanks so much for for joining me coming on to the bird emergency uh wish you well i really wish you well and please keep us updated because uh people are interested in the plains wanderer they love the plains wanderer the kooky australia's kooky bird the kooky bird um yeah and look yeah just when your milestones crop up um just keep us Keep us in mind and let's try and get you and Dan together when you've maybe got a bit more, um, you know, interim. Uh, inter- do you have interim results when you're doing a PhD? Yeah, I mean, I need to get in start analysing some of my data. So, yeah, hopefully in the next yeah. year or so we should have some some vague outlines of what, what's happening and some, yeah, a couple of years of data there to sit on. So, yeah, it'd be good to have another chat and update you guys on how it's all going and what it's looking like. Love to hear about it. Love to hear about it. Okay, bird nerds, don't forget uh, the fight for hashtag Toonda continues to go on. Uh, above me are the Twitter handles for the people who can influence the uh, the shoreline of Moreton Bay and the Far Eastern Curlew and all the other shorebirds who are the ancestors, the contemporaries of the ancestors of the Plains Wanderer. I want to be one later. That's right. And what a lovely place to end up. That's been the Bird Emergency. I'm Grant. I'm a bird nerd. Saskia Gerhardi from the University of Adelaide and Bush Heritage Australia. Thanks so much. See you next time. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, guys. Been a pleasure. Bye. Bye.